G'day everyone, my name's Tom Robinson and I'm going to take you on a bit of a tour of my ocean rowing boat, Maywa. This is going to be my home for the next 9 to 12 months that I designed and built myself specifically to row solo across the Pacific Ocean from South America to Australia. She's 24 feet long and 6 feet wide. She's built out of marine plywood. The boat was built on the banks of the Brisbane River. A lot of training has been done on the river and Maywa is the Aboriginal name for the Brisbane River. So I thought it was a very fitting name for the boat. So the design from Maywa was inspired by whaling boats. These whaling boats were, were tenders to a mothership and they would sail out into the Pacific and they'd have four or five boats just like this, but they were open and four or five men would row out to harpoon whales. Historically, it's interesting, but more importantly, the hull shape for me was perfect for, for a boat that I needed to cross the Pacific Ocean in. So whale boat hulls are defined by their symmetry, so they're very similar fore and aft. Uh, they've got a really nice fine entry, nice curve to the, um, to the bow profile, and they've got a relatively hard turn to the bilge, which is this section here. So they've got quite good initial stability. And for me, that's really important. I think, I think initial stability in a rowing boat is really vital, especially when you're in a choppy sea, because when you're trying to take a stroke, if the boat's rocking and rolling around, trying to get a decent stroke in is really hard. So a bit more initial stability is quite, quite important. Um, she's obviously quite a departure from her original whaling boat. Um, the biggest hull shape difference is that she's fuller in the stern here. So usually that'd be really quite fine in the stern, but I bulked it out a bit in this section because this is where I'm going to be keeping a hell of a lot of food and water. And so for that, I need that extra volume there to carry that weight. So nowadays, a lot of boats are designed on a computer, uh, which is all well and good, but I, being a traditionalist, I wanted to keep it simple. And so um, this boat started off as a block of wood. And then from that block of wood, I carved a half model, which is half the hull, so the hull cut down the middle. From that half model, I made cuts into it, measured the hull at those cuts. From those measurements, I drew it on a piece of paper at one to 10 scale. And then from that one to 10 scale, I took off measurements and then drew out the boat full size on some sheets of plywood called lofting. And then from that lofting, I was able to get patterns to form the hull shape to wrap the planks around. Construction of Maywa was an enjoyable and challenging process for me. It was the first large boat I've built myself. And um, so there was a steep learning curve involved to combine modern technology with traditional materials and shapes and aesthetics because what I really needed was a watertight monocoque structure. Traditionally, clinker built boats were fastened with copper nails and although that's a fine method, for me I needed something that was really strong and I felt confident with. And so for that, um, the hulls basically held together with epoxy resin. So. Um, We'll start from the bow and we'll do a bit of a rundown of some features and components of the vessel. First thing we'll start with is this bow roller. Mm -hmm. It's pretty simple, just a plastic sheave here mm -hmm. and then there's a stainless hoop that goes over the top so that the sea anchor line can't ride up over it and fall out of the sheave. We've got a U-bolt down here for the trailer and for towing if the boat ever needs to be towed. Got a nice big horn cleat. I really don't think um, there's anything wrong with an extra large horn cleat on the bow. They're so handy and especially when you need to tie extra ropes on etc. And this is the anchor well here. It's, it's just a simple self-draining anchor well. There's holes in the side of the hull. Um, there's a canvas cover on top that'll keep out 90% of the um, seas or rain. Um, so we'll just open up and have a look inside. Inside we've got a, a Butte aluminium anchor from Cooper Anchors made here in Australia I believe but I could be wrong. Um, when I'm at sea the anchor won't be stored here. It'll be down low in the boat. But when I'm nearing islands and when I'm around the islands, that anchor will be really useful. You can see down here, there's a nice generous hole here. Um, so when, if water does get into the anchor well, um, it'll drain out. The centerboard's another afterthought. Um, so she, the centerboard wasn't on the boat when I launched it. But after sea trialling it and rowing into some strong headwinds, I found that um, you really need the centerboard to hold the bow into the breeze. As soon as the breeze gets one side of the bow, it just wants to blow it off and you're constantly correcting pain in the bum basically. So I've got this um, got this board here, it's just a simple piece of hardwood that's shaped up for the job and um, you just remove a pin and this falls down and that's going to really help your windward ability. Hopefully I won't be trying to row to windward much on this trip but um, no doubt it'll happen at some point.
Okay, next up, we've got a mushroom vent here. That's a really important part of the boat, really. Um, that lets in air without letting water in. So if it's pissing down rain or there's a little bit of a sea and I need to have this hatch here closed, I can still open up the mushroom vent and let air and ventilation into the boat, um, which, will, which will be a really big help. Um, after the mushroom vent, we've got a Vetus hatch here. That's a nice little unit, very easy to use and install. So between the main hatch on the bulkhead aft there and this hatch here in the mushroom vent here, there'll be a lot of circulation of air when the weather's good. And so on the journey, I'll be taking six oars with me, four of which are carbon fiber and two are spruce. At the moment, I've just got one spruce oar either side. The other two spare carbon oars will sit in these bits of timber here and they'll be strapped on with timber. Um, these are the oars that I'll be rowing with each day and at the end of every day they lock into these gates here. So they just sit in there like that and that does up and then they're secure there, there's nowhere they can go. Um, so a lot of people ask what this little black dot is here and that's actually a porthole. I didn't want to have one on the boat originally because I think that they look ugly, they're usually quite large um, but a porthole's a really important safety feature on the boat. So when you're on anchor, you need to be able to wake up in the night and look out and make sure that the lights are in the same position they were at um, when you went to bed. And um, someone cleverer than me said, why don't you just make a little tiny porthole and you can stick your eye up to it and see out. And I did that and it's really, really effective. Once you're close enough up to it, you've got a broad range of vision, which is very handy. So as you can see, there's a, a healthy handrail down the middle here. Um, that was also another suggestion from someone and it's turned out to be really, really useful. It's just a really solid handhold. It's good to tie things to, and that's really helpful. That was just laminated up out of some teak, cut to shape, and glued and screwed on. So every sliding seat rowing boat needs to be adjustable for different sizes of human to, to row. Um, depending on the length of your legs, that can change the whole geometry of it. On most shells and other sliding seat rowing boats, the foot stretcher moves fore and aft, and that compensates for your leg length, and therefore the oars um, stay at the right position in relation to your torso. On this boat, I didn't want to be able to move the foot stretcher because that's a bit more complicated, but I still wanted to make it so other people could row the boat. So I came up with the idea of having three different positions for the, for the gates. And that was as simple as just drilling three different holes and then um, inserting a tube of um, stainless, and then inserting stainless steel tube into that hole. And so now I've got three different, different different positions. So I'm of average height, so someone taller than me would probably use this position here, someone shorter would use this one. So the gates on this boat are really, really vital. If, if, if I don't have a way, for, if I don't have a fulcrum for the oar, then I'm pretty stuck. Um, so these are pretty standard, um, standard items you'll find on any racing shell, but they're um, a bit stronger and beefier. And they're attached to a 13 millimeter pin that goes right the way through a big block underneath here. And there's a cotter pin that goes through that. So there's no way that, um, so yeah, so this is really, 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 really strong part of the boat. And I can't see any of these components breaking, but if they do, there's spares for everything, of course. A bit of a flaw I've noticed in a lot of other ocean rowing boats is that the gates are mounted outboard of the gunnel of the boat. Um, you get a little bit more leverage with that extra span, but it's really quite unseamanlike because every time you want to come alongside another vessel, you've got this big thing sticking out. Um, and of course, every boat comes alongside other boats or wharfs at times, and so you don't want any sort of protrusion from the hull that's likely to get damaged. Um, so for that, I wanted to make sure that the gates were inboard of, of the gunnel. And because these are mounted on a long pin, I can easily take out the clip from, from underneath and lift these out, meaning that there's no way that um, my boat can get damaged or that I can damage another boat. The solar panels now, they're sort of top of the range, I guess, flexible solar panels made in Italy. Uh, I've got two, one either side. They're quite small and they power two 55 amp hour AGM batteries. It's a pretty simple, robust system and definitely up for the task. So when we go through the electrics on the boat, you'll see that it's a really simple system. I've got an AIS transmitter, uh, VHF radio, um, and then obviously cabin lights, navigation lights, and that's really about it for, for the boat. There's also USB charging ports and that sort of thing. The solar panels and the batteries are definitely over-spec for the boat, but you want to have more power than less, basically. In the cockpit of the boat is the main part of the boat where I'll be spending the bulk of my time at sea. This is where it all happens, where the rowing takes place. 
quite simple really. And we've got a nice self-draining deck here um, with large um, scuppers down each side. Uh, so any water that any water that does come in big wave seas, for example, they can drain out very quickly. Um, I've got a simple sliding seat here, and I've got my foot stretcher here. So I'll be rowing like this, sliding back and forth, and um, it, this will be me for 250 days. How exciting! Um, for steering the boat, I've got two rudder lines here, and for the rudder, I've got two options. Either I can lock them into these little cam cleats here and have the rudder locked off at a particular angle, or I can clip these lines onto the top of this foot stretcher here, and then from there, I'm able to move the, move the rudder with my foot. So it'll just depend on the sea state, the conditions, where I am, as to how, as to how I want to steer the boat. Um, we've got a footwell here. That's a really nice little part of the boat. It just means that it, like, it will fill up sometimes in big seas, but on the whole, it just makes the boat a lot more ergonomic and friendly and nice. And I can push the seat back here and sit down here if, 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 if I want to and keep my center of gravity low. So this would be a nice place to have a meal at the end of the day. So a big feature about this, this rudder that you don't see on a lot of other ocean rowing boats is that it's able to lift up and down and you can use it at any height up or down. That's gonna be really helpful when I'm rowing in shallow waters. Um, so just with this line here, I'm able to lift it up and then slide it back down. And when I'm rowing along and it's really shallow, the rudder actually rises and falls to the depth as it hits the bottom, which is quite handy. Every boat needs a compass. It's a vital part of your navigation and it's how I'll be keeping on course. The issue when you're rowing is that you're facing the wrong way. So with a normal bulkhead mounted compass, um, it reads the opposite of the way you're traveling. So a bulkhead mounted compass is designed to mount on a forward bulkhead. And so you look at it from the forward end and you say, okay, that's my course, you know, 50 degrees, 130, whatever it is. But when you're rowing, you're looking the wrong way. And so um, traditionally you have to take off 180 degrees from whatever you read on the compass, which is fine, but it's not real cool. Um, I contacted Cassens and Plath in Germany who are um, well-known compass and sextant makers and they, they're really, really high quality precision instruments. We worked together and they were able to make this compass for me with the card swapped 180. So although it says it's north there, that's actually south. So it'll read right for me when I'm rowing. As far as I know, it's the only ocean rowing compass in the world. So I can't be more thankful to Cousins and Plath for custom making a compass just for the journey. I really like the company and what they're about. So to have a famous German manufacturer um, on board for the for the journey is a really heartwarming part and is one of the highlights of the whole um, process of getting to this stage. So in this section of the hull there's seven separate watertight compartments. That's a really important thing. Not only does it protect the hull if one part of the boat were to get pierced, but it also means that the stores can be allocated to different areas and you can open up a certain section and know what's in it. So to seal up those different parts of the hull, I've got seven whale watertight locker doors. That's really simple um, and really effective. And so in here, there's a hell of a lot of room and storage. So with the seven watertight compartments, there's one here, one here, one there, one there, and it's the same on the other side of the cockpit as well. There's two bilge pumps on the boat, one on the aft bulkhead here and one on the forward bulkhead there. That bilge pump there goes straight into the cabin. And if necessary, I can be out here and pump out the cabin if it fills up with water. There's another bilge pump on a bulkhead just below me here. That goes inside this hatch here to a uh, Y valve. So, and then off that Y valve, there's two hoses. One hose goes into the bottom here and another hose goes into the footwell here. So depending on like if there's any section that's filled up with water, I can pump out whatever section I need. The hose that goes into the footwell is long enough to reach any different of these seven compartments. So if one were to fill up, if I left it open and a wave came in, then I can get this hose, put it in there and then pump out the water, which is a hell of a lot easier than trying to get in there with a jar and scoop it out. So I've got to take a hell of a lot of food and water, safety gear, spares, etc. And for that, you need a lot of storage space. So back here is the um, biggest storage compartment of the boat. If you open up here, um, there's a really big compartment in here and um, that'll hold a hell of a lot of food and water. So as you can see, there's heaps of room in here. <laughs> Thank you.
This is the main hatch to get in and out of the cabin. It's a Vetus and it's completely watertight. Here we are inside the cabin of Maywa. It's surprisingly spacious, but a simple affair. Um, we've got the bed here, lee cloths, electronics on this side, and on this side here we've got drawers, navigation equipment, etc. In this box here is where I keep the sextant. So there we are. So that comes out of there, and that's... So this is where my sextant lives, basically. A barometer here that measures the pressure of the air and is an indication of what the weather's going to do. Um, so this is where I'll be doing a lot of my navigating. Um, pretty simple. In here we've got a couple of drawers. You can never have enough drawers or storage on a boat. Here, this is just another partition for storage. So I can throw things in here. It's just like a locker, really. Um, here's our porthole. So in here we have our navigation equipment. That's stored in a box that's watertight, so even if the cabin did have water in it, it um, wouldn't affect the boat. So you look in here, we've got our, our battery isolator switch. Here we've got our switch panel, um, voltage display, USB charger, um, cigarette plug, and over here we've got our VHF radio. That's pretty simple. Let's flip that one on for you. Channel 16, pretty simple. Also in this box that you can't see is um, is the AIS transmitter. That's a little box connected up to an aerial that transmits my position when I turn on the switch here. This is the out pipe for the bilge pump. So that runs down here to the bottom of the boat where there's a strum box there. And next to it is the bilge pump handle. That's pretty simple. Um, this part of the boat here, here we've got a little step it's a step, it's a seat, and it's also the battery box. So under here you'll see we've got our two um, 55 amp hour batteries. On this side we've got one of the two EPIRBs, one's inside and one's outside. Here's a lee cloth here, um, and these bits of canvas here just mean that when the boat's rocking and rolling, I can only roll so far, I'm not going to be thrown from one side of the boat to the other. Um, up forward here, which is where my feet will be, is a bookshelf. Here's a centerboard case, and there's little drawers here for storage. Here we've got a couple of handholds. They're really simple and quite effective. They're just made from this strapping, so they're not gonna. I'm not gonna hurt myself if 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 I fall on them. We've got storage nets on either side here, and um, when when the weather's good or I'm in port, I can just undo these hooks here and the hooks at the back as well, and undo this um, canvas lee cloth here, and I can have a nice, lovely, it's almost like a double berth, really. I'm not a big fan of varnish on boats, but a little bit can make a big difference to the um, aesthetics of, of the vessel. Um, in this case, to build this um, bubble cabin here, I, I used a method called cold molding or double diagonal, and so um, there's two layers of four millimeter plywood and they run at 90 degrees to each other. So you can see the first layer here, the other layer comes the opposite way and that's really strong and rigid. Um, it's varnished so you can, you know, it looks quite cool, I think. The boats that Maywai is based off have really stood the test of time. There are thousands of other whaling boats that faced all sorts of conditions. And so with a hull shape like that, I knew that I was going to be safe and that Maywai will be up to it.